This is perhaps the biggest objection for not only Protestants, but Jehovah's Witnesses and just non-Catholics in general. And that's how could the Catholic Church believe that Mary is sinless of all things. Only God is sinless, they say. So you are basically making Mary God. Why would you do that? And they say it completely contradicts scripture because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if all have sinned, that would absolutely include Mary, who's in the line of Adam, who's a sinner. So why does the Catholic Church hold and teach that Mary was in fact sinless? Yeah, with regard to the first challenge that to say Mary is sinless makes her out to be God because only God is sinless, well, then that wouldn't work for the souls in heaven, the blessed in heaven, because they're sinless, but they're not God. It is true that God is sinless by nature, but that doesn't mean non, uh, that doesn't mean creatures can't be sinless, uh, non infinite or finite rational creatures can't be sinless by grace. And that is the case for the blessed in heaven. They are sinless by grace in as much as they have sight of the, of the divine essence in the beatific vision. And even for the blessed virgin, who did not have the beatific vision, but nevertheless could be sinless in virtue of a special grace that God gives her, a grace that always at every moment of her existence is upholding her in the good actualizing her free will to always be in conformity with the divine will. How does God do that without violating freedom? That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother show and a whole nother question. But the point is, is that to affirm that Mary was sinless does not entail that she is divine. It doesn't entail that she is God. You can be sinless and not divine, okay, as the blessed are in heaven and by a special grace. Now, with regard to the, the scriptural uh, case for Mary's sinlessness, you posed an objection from Romans 3.23, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, we know that there are going to be exceptions to that general rule, precisely because there are some human beings who and who are who are not subject to personal sin. In Romans 3:23 Paul is talking about personal sin. He talks about original sin in Romans 5. But in Romans 3:23 he's talking about personal sin. And we know there's at least some exceptions to the general rule. Infants in the womb cannot personally sin, and so they have not personally fallen short of the glory of God. So they're an exception. The severely mentally handicapped cannot personally sin because they don't have full use of reason and will due to their handicapped nature, due to their, their, their handicapped ailment. So they have not fallen short of the glory of God by way of personal sin. And so Brian, if, and, and by the way, with regard to the infants being exceptions, Roman is, Paul is very clear on this in Romans chapter nine, when he's talking about Esau and Jacob in the womb, not having committed any evil. And so Paul believes infants are exceptions to the general rule. So the argument is, if there are at least some exceptions to the general rule, then Brian, it's at least possible that Mary could be an exception to the general rule and not have personally fallen short of the glory of God. And given that there's at least a possibility, one cannot appeal to Romans 3.23 in such an absolute way that it, it necessarily includes Mary. So it's not a proof text against our belief that Mary was immaculately conceived, or in this case, even free from personal sin. So that's a way that we can diffuse the challenge. But I would argue, with regard to Mary's sinlessness, the key text is looking to Genesis 3.15 and the Proto-Evangelium, the first good news where all Christians recognize that this is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, Jesus, and the prophecy of how Jesus will redeem the human race by defeating the serpent, the devil. Genesis 3.15 talks about God says to the serpent, I will set enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
Well, if all Christians recognize that that's a prophecy on the supernatural, there's a literal historical level where it's referencing Eve and her offspring. But all Christians recognize, even on a prophetical level, that that's a reference to Jesus and Satan. And if it's a reference to Jesus and Satan, then it must also be a reference to the to Mary, the mother of the Messiah. Now watch this, Brian. Notice how God says, he draws a parallel between the enmity that will exist between the devil and the seed of the woman, that is the Messiah, Jesus, and the enmity between the serpent and the woman, that is Mary. So if the enmity, the separation between the devil, the serpent, and Jesus, the seed of the woman, is complete and entire from the moment of Jesus being in the womb of the Blessed Virgin and throughout the rest of his human existence, his human life, well then so too, the separation, the enmity between the devil, the serpent, and the woman, Mary, is going to be complete and entire, which means the woman, Mary, is going to be separated from the devil from the moment of her conception and throughout the rest of her earthly life. And do we see that fulfilled in the New Testament anywhere? Yeah, so we have indications where the New Testament authors seem to be drawing our attention to Mary being that woman. So, for example, at the wedding feast of Cana, when Jesus calls Mary woman, that's that's set against the backdrop of a new creation theme. We don't have time to go into those details but I articulate that, I think I do so in my book, Meeting the Protestant Response, where Jesus is calling Mary woman against the backdrop of the creation story. And given that Jesus is calling Mary woman in that, in that sort of narrative, we can conclude that Mary is the woman of Genesis 3.15 at the foot of the cross when Jesus is crushing the very head of the serpent. What does he call Mary? Woman. And of course, John and his revelation in Revelation 12, 1 through 5, he gives he, he has the vision of the male child who, who is trying to be devoured by the red dragon, which John identifies as the serpent of old. So you have the serpent, you have the child, and guess what? John talks about the woman. And so who is that woman? The mother of the messianic king. It's Mary. So we have Mary identified as that woman of Genesis 3.15 in the Christian tradition within the New Testament. And with regard to Mary being uh, set in that enmity, it's hinted at, although not proved, in Luke one twenty eight, when the angel Gabriel says Mary is full of grace, kikari tomine, which suggests a past action of being put in grace, resulting in a permanent state of being in grace. It doesn't get us all the way back to Mary's immaculate conception, but it's at least hinting at it. Thank you very much. And um, again, if you would like to see more information on this, please check out his book, Meeting the Protestant Challenge, which is his first book, and Meeting the Protestant Response, which is his second book. And we have one dogma to go. So let's do that.